morning, everyone. Morning. 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 Good morning. What's going on, people? Doing, man. How's everybody? I want to remind us before we jump in, um, April 17th, Resurrection Sunday, we'll be gathering for in-person service. Um, we've got a worship team that'll come in uh, to help facilitate for us. I want to encourage everyone um, to come out, not because it's Easter or Resurrection Sunday and we're obligated to do a service, but more so to come out and to gather into fellowship and connect with one another and to collectively, collectively worship the Lord together. I think there's power in that. So I look forward to seeing everybody there. Again, welcome. Hope everybody's well on this rainy Sunday morning. It's always hard to get jump started on a rainy Sunday morning. But today, we are going to continue our conversation around paradigm shifting, right? Rethinking everything that we do about the church and trying to look at these things through a biblically oriented lens. So today, we're going to be talking about sharing the gospel sharing the gospel. Now, our base kind of formula that we've been looking at is, is, is this model. There are primary functions that God has called us to as a church, the primary missions of the church. And then there are forms, methods that we choose. Methods are temporary. Methods aren't the focus. Methods are means to accomplish the functions. And we've been looking at all these different functions, worship, baptism, discipleship, communion, fellowship, prayer, love. We've been focusing the last two weeks on evangelism. That's a primary function of the church, evangelism. We talked about um, the ownership of evangelism. Who has the responsibility for evangelism, right? And, and that responsibility isn't on the evangelist, that responsibility is on all of us because we found out that God says that all of us are ambassadors and we've been entrusted with the message and ministry of reconciliation. We know that the primary mission of the church is to make disciples, right? That's the primary mission. However, we cannot make disciples until individuals are converted. That's an important thing. Conversion, not church membership, not folks have to be converted before they can become disciples. But the only way they can become converted is through evangelism. So traditionally, we were we we were taught, and 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 I'm 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 being intentionally redundant here. Traditionally, we're taught and we're trained within the church culture today, hey, invite people to church. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm not saying it's wrong to invite people to church. But the emphasis has been on, hey, let's invite people to church. That's evangelism, getting people to come into church. But real evangelism is, hey, let me share the message of the gospel with people in the everyday fabric of my life, in my home and in, in my community and the groups and, 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 and people that I interact with. And then we get them to come to church, not to be evangelized, but we get them to come to church to be trained, equipped and disciple. See, that's a paradigm shift. That's a different paradigm shift. We established this, this working principle that evangelism isn't inviting people to a relationship with the church, but it's more so about inviting people to a relationship with Jesus. So for us, as we think about our lives, because life is hectic, because life is busy, I am as busy as anybody else. Life is busy. I gotta be out of town for two days. Um, uh, Monday and Tuesday. Life is busy. Life is hectic. What we tend to do is to build walls around our, uh, around our lives and to become internally focused. 
and then we're just we're just focused on the pressures and demands and looking inward in our lives. And what happens is life goes by and we forget about our mission. We forget about engaging with the, with the lost people that are around us. When we understand the paradigm shift about evangelism, that it's more than just inviting people to church, but it's having an external focus of my life, that yes, I meet the demands and the responsibilities that are placed on me in this hectic world, but that I have an external focus about my life, that I'm looking for opportunities to engage and to connect with people, to share the message of the gospel. And when we have that mindset, I guarantee you guys, God will create opportunities. See, the, the Lord knows whether or not in our heart and in our spirit, we are open to the sharing of the gospel. If we're not open to it, he's not going to create the opportunities because he's not going to make us do anything that we don't want to do. But if we are open to it, if we remove the restrictions and the limitations, man, you'll be amazed about the opportunities that God will create for you. So we talked about the gospel in the sense that there's an urgency to the gospel, there's power in the gospel. And there's light in the gospel, right? So the, this message, there's an urgency to it, right? There's power in it. Paul said it's the power of God unto salvation. And that the light of the gospel is what opens the blind eyes of those who the God of this world has blinded. This is what we, this is what we uh, looked at last week in terms of the context of the gospel. What, 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 what is the what? What are the the, the the framing elements that 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 make up the content of the gospel? So we said that the gospel is really it, it it centered around this ideal that God wants to be with us. God created us to be with us, and He set this whole plan in, plan in motion so that we can have relationship and intimacy with him. That it, it's our sins that separate us from God. And, we, and we're going to we're, we're, we're look at um, some of these things in a little bit more detail. That you, 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 sins can't be dealt with by our good deeds. Jesus paid the price for, for our sin through his, his death and resurrection. You, know, you get eternal life because you trust in what Jesus has done for you. And eternal life lasts with God forever. So that's that's kind of like the basic framework when you think about content of the gospel. Now, here's a question for us. This is open for, for, for input here. Uh, why is understanding the gospel message so important? Because it speaks of who Jesus is. Speaks of who Jesus is. Because that's why we were left here. That's why we were left here. And also so what he has done for us. I'm sorry, Mona. No, that's okay. Go right ahead. Go on. Also what Jesus has done for us by the death, burial, and resurrection. Mm -hmm. Mona, you're going you're gonna to add something? Mona, were you going to add something? Okay. Speaking. No, am I unmuted? There I am. Okay. I was going to say it's a matter of life and death. If it you is. believe that Jesus is the Christ, you have life. And if you just believe that Jesus died for our sins, but you don't believe he's the Christ, Sonny was just here and we were just talking about it. She doesn't believe he's God. She doesn't believe in the Trinity. She's facing death. Yep. So, so, so the gospel message... It's important. And when you when you think about here, let me do this. Let me, get, let, me, let me get ahead of myself here. So this is the condition of man, right? Man is separated from a holy God. Right? There's a gulf. Man's disconnected. The problem in the world 
isn't so much sin. The problem in the world is that man is connected, disconnected from his creator, from his identity, and from his purpose, and from his true nature. <laughs> Everything else is just symptomatic of that deeper root problem. And so what man has done, man has created for himself religion and morality and good works as a way to try to bridge the gulf <laughs> that separates him from God. The gospel is important because the gospel is the only bridge that can allow man to connect with God. Works can't do it, religion can't do it, and morality can't do it. The only thing that can provide the means for a lost individual to be connected with the God that made him, shaped him, loves him, gave his son for him, is the message of the gospel. So being born again comes from the power of the word. Let's look at two scriptural bases for this. We talked about this a little bit on Wednesday, and I'm just doing a, 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 a framework, and then we're going to jump into how do we share the gospel. But John 1, 12, 13, um, someone read that for us. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Okay. So when we look at this verse here, we talked about, again, we, we talked about this on, on Wednesday. We had a good study on Wednesday. We talked about this on Wednesday. Um, He identifies what, what, what I call three counterfeit conversions in this text. Can you identify what they are? For the bloodline lineage through your good morals, and through the appointing of man. Yeah. Thank you, Dorothy. Yeah. Not, 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 who were born not of blood, right? Just because your parents were saved, just because you were raised in the church, that don't mean you're born again. Sorry. But we teach that. I've been in church all my life. Well, when did you get born again? That's the question. Can't get passed down by blood lineage, nor by the will of the flesh. I can't, I can't by good works and effort and striving, I can't save myself, nor by the will of man. And this is where it gets dangerous. By the will of man, it's when institutions, because somebody adhered to their system and structure, assign on to somebody's salvation. No can only come of God, not by blood lineage, not by human effort and striving, good works, nor by the will of that. Well, they came up front, they said the sinner's prayer, they got baptized. And that's not to say that people who, 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 who respond to an altar call, get baptized, go through new members class, that's not to say they're not saved. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is, those things don't constitute salvation. They may be what individuals do who have come to salvation in faith, 
But because somebody goes through those mechanics, that's not what makes them born again. That's what this verse is speaking to. The only thing that can produce being born again, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. We're trying to understand why the gospel is so important. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Someone read this for us and read it, read it slow and purposeful, please. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. So, so God tells us, I, I can't be born of blood. I can't be born again of the flesh. I can't be born of the will of man, but of God. And now Peter tells us specifically, how is it that I'm born again? By the imperishable, living, and abiding word of God. I can't get born again without some word. That imperishable seed. The gospel contains the living, abiding word of God. That is the only bridge available for somebody to become born again. To come into uh, a relationship with God. Now, what anybody just kind of think about? Because, because you know, you know, we, we we've been in church for a long time. We've been around these these thoughts and these themes for a long time, and often they could just be words to us. But I want you to think about this for a moment, because the question is, why is the gospel so important? Because without it, you can't, a person can't get born again. The gospel, if you look at the screen here, the gospel, the message of the gospel, what God has provided for man through Christ, that's the only thing that can bridge that gap. Attending a church service can't do it. Just believing that God exists can't do it. Just believing in a set of moral principles can't do it. The gospel is the only means by which the folks that you and I know that aren't saved are ever going to come into a saving relationship with God. How shall they hear? How shall they believe on him whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear unless someone tell them? And how shall someone tell them lest they be sent. I have news for you. All of us have been sent. What are the challenges that we face with sharing the gospel? Why do you, why, why is it we don't do it as often as we should. What challenges do we face? What intimidates us about it? You could use it, you could lose your friends because you believe. Okay, you could lose friends. Okay. I think people fear rejection. Mm, fear rejection. That's the word. Misunderstandment. Like you don't want them to think that. You don't want them to misunderstand the message and them to feel like you're judging them or throwing the Bible at them or. All right. Folks, folks will think they're being judged. Okay. It's good. 
other reasons why it's challenging to share the gospel. Can, 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 can we come to this agreement? Because my job as a pastor is a challenge, right? Not to make you feel comfortable with where you are. Would, 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 we, would we all kind of agree within our own heart that we need to do more than what we've been doing in sharing the gospel? Would, would, would all of us kind of stipulate to that? Yep. Mm -hmm. And so That's what I was going to say. It was not, it's not a priority. Yeah, thank you, Mark. It's not a priority. Yeah. Now, here's the question, right? What's the primary mission that Jesus gave to the church? Go out and make, make disciples. Yes, ma'am. Right? If that's the primary mission, why isn't sharing the gospel, which is the means by making disciples, why isn't that a priority for, for the church? Too busy, worried about ourselves. Mm. Too busy. I think too, Dave, a lot of it's the pursuit of money and worldly treasures. Yeah. Our own pursuits. The pursuit of stuff. Stuff. Listen, you need stuff now. Don't get me Come wrong. On. Right? Mm -hmm. But there's mm -hmm. the balance, right? And this is where this is where like it's it's learning to trust God, like to give, to surrender, and then trust Him that He can He can get you what you need as you surrender your life to Him, so that from His life He can get what, so that from our lives He can get what He needs. If He can get what He needs out of our life, I am a living testimony. He will make sure you get what you need. That's why he said, seek first the kingdom. Don't worry about all that other stuff. I know you need it. I got you. You seek first the kingdom. All that stuff will be added unto you. So, so busy. We're afraid we're going to lose friends. It's the fear of rejection. The, 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 the fear of being misunderstood, that the message is going to be misunderstood and people will think that we're, 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 we're judging them. It's not really a priority for us. What other thing, what, what other, is there anything else that we could add to the list? What, why don't we share this message that is the really the most important message that we could ever give as a church? As the people- Sometimes I don't feel confident like in my knowledge too. That's what of I, the message that I'm sh sharing. Yeah, I was going to say something along the lines of that as well. Just, just not, not, uh, not feeling you have the knowledge, you know, to to properly share, you know, with someone. Yeah, good. That that that's what I was fishing for. <laughs> that's what I was fishing for. That right there. Yeah, I think you, also, Dave, it's your lifestyle. Oh no, that's a whole other conversation, there, Lance. But go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no. I mean, I think it's our, it's our lifestyle, you know, and the fear of being a poor witness for the Lord. Yeah. Because we are very much human. And I'm going to tell you, I don't always act godly. So it's it's difficult for me to, ch to share when people don't always see what I'm saying. Yeah. You know, what I'm saying and what they're seeing is not the same all the time. Thank you for thank you for that honesty and transparency, right? Um, because that that we'll build on that we'll build on that later. But that's a real that's that's a real issue. Like most of us, most of us hesitated and delayed to coming into relationship with Christ because we didn't like. Folks who said they knew Jesus, but didn't act like Jesus, right? Now, I ain't fooling with them hypocrites. At least the folks in the club, at least they real. These folks are phony. So that is that 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 is a piece and component of it. And once we understand that this gospel message, man, it's 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 so important, then like oftentimes the, the motivation 
to govern in my life isn't so much driven by me, but it's driven by I want to mess up God's name and I don't want to be a hindrance to God using me. So again, again, that's that's that living outside in versus inside out. But 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 to the to the point, the last point that was made, oftentimes we don't understand the message. We don't have confidence in exactly what to share, right? That's why today I want to talk about sharing the gospel. How do we share this gospel? And I want to walk you through a real simple tool that's called the Romans Road to Salvation. Now, I'm old school. This is something that was floating around back 30-something years ago when I first became, became a believer. And I am, I am, man, I hope, I, I don't want to say this in sounds. Um, I'm just surprised that this is something that most believers today hadn't heard of doesn't know exist, right? This Roman road, it's, 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 it's a model and a way for a person to easily be able to share the essential elements of the gospel with a person in a very structured way, right from one book of the Bible, the book of Romans. And we're gonna walk through what this Roman roads are. But, but, but Marv, you remember when we were having a conversation with, um, the, the, uh, the, the social media people. Yes. And I asked them about the Romans road. Yes. What was their response? Uh, they've never heard of it. They didn't know what you were talking about. And these are folks that work with, that work with churches around the country. One of them is a pastor's daughter. Yes. So. Let me, so, so we're going to walk through the Romans road, give you a high level, and then I'm going to send this, I'm going to send, I'm going to send a document out to you that you can kind of just use. But here, what you have on the screen is just a, um, a, a strategic framework, if you will, of the book of Romans. How many of us um, have read the book of Romans? Or rather, who hasn't read the book of Romans? I haven't read the whole book of Romans, but I've read pieces of it. Yeah, yeah. I'd encourage everyone to to, to read to read at least the first first nine chapters of, of, of the book of Romans because it, it's it's structured in a very systematic way that lends itself well to being a tool for sharing the gospel with individuals. It defines the nature of how the world is lost. And then it defines the framework necessary to come to salvation through grace by faith. And it's laid out in a very, very structured way. Um, I don't have this on the screen. Uh, let me do this first. All right. So this right here is a breakdown of the questions, if you will, that kind of guide and direct the Romans road to salvation. It's structured in a way that you can have like a dialogue with people. Like, is anyone perfect? Is, is, is there any exception, right? Where, where does sin come from? What do we deserve for our sin? But that, who paid the price for the sin? Is there a way out? It, it, it could be used as a conversational piece to walk people through the key elements of the gospel. Now, here's what's not on the screen, but I wanna read this, and then we're gonna walk through each of these um, uh, six elements of the Romans road for salvation. And it's, it's just a couple of verses, each one. And again, the whole goal here is just to, to show you that there's a tool available that you don't have to be intimidated by, you don't have to memorize 30 different scriptures. You don't have to be steeped in deep theology in order to be able to walk people through this very concise biblical instruction about how do you bridge the gap between being lost and being in relationship with God. But I want to read something to you from Romans chapter 1. Verse 1. 
this isn't in the Romans' road to salvation. If I made this up, I would put this in there. This this would be the first this this would be the first point I would make in the Romans' road to salvation. But if you have your Bibles open, I want you to turn to a Romans chapter one. Romans chapter one. We're going to start with 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 uh, what we read earlier, and then we're going to read down to verse 18. So Romans 1, verse 16, this is where Paul says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek, verse 17, for in it, it, the gospel, for in, for in it, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. In other words, when we proclaim the gospel to people, we are revealing to them God's righteousness. Because what is it that people who are unsaved often accuse God of? Judging God being I was say punishment, yeah, punishment, right? God ain't fair, but why he let all this happen in the world if he's so loving? Why he let this? Why he let that? Right? So, the, the message of the gospel reveals the righteousness of God, but right? the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. But here's what I wanted to get to verse 18 for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Now, I wish I had this on the screen because I want you to see this, but if you got your Bibles open, and you should always jump on the Zoom with your Bible and have your Bible open. Verse 18, verse 18 says God is mad. Verse 18 says, for the wrath of God, wrath means, so God's got some anger, right? But if you got your Bible open, what is God actually angry about? Sinful, wicked people who, who suppress the truth of God. Now read that again. Take a look at it. Take a mm -hmm. look. Against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppresses the truth mm -hmm. and so, unrighteousness. So God is mad. Not He's not mad at mm -hmm. men. Yeah. What is he mad at? Isn't he mad at their actions, what there, they don't do? You got mm -hmm. it. There you go. See, because the gospel has been misrepresented that God's mad. Mm -hmm. And God wants to send everybody to hell. Mm -hmm. What God is upset about is the ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Because that godliness and unrighteousness, which is the result of Adam's nature in us, that causes us to suppress the truth. What truth? The truth that it suppresses is the nature of God that's in us. And when men act according to their fallen nature, they can't reflect what God intended for man to reflect when he made man from the beginning. So that the gospel begins with the message that God's not mad at you. God is mad about what sin is producing in you. And that's a completely different framing of the gospel. And that's why, to Shayla's point, some people will think they're being judged when you share the gospel because people don't share the right gospels. They share moralism or religion. So, that's just David Jones's first point in the Romans road to salvation. God ain't mad at you. 
God is mad at sin, not you. He's made a way for you to come out. So let's walk through this. This will be real quick. Let's walk through this Romans road to salvation. So the first point, is anyone perfect? Is anyone perfect? What's the, what's, what's, what is the perception that unsaved people have of Christian folk and Christian folk's attitude? That they don't do any wrong, that they're perfect, like you said. Yeah, but, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? So, 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 this is what the gospel says, right? The Romans rule to salvation. So, so think about yourself having a conversation with somebody. And you invite somebody over to your house or some, somewhere out for, for, for coffee, right? And you say, you know, I, I just want to share with you um, the message that God wants you to understand and know. That he wants to be in relationship with you. First of all, he's not really mad. God's not angry at people. God's angry at what sin is doing in people. The second point is, God says there's nobody perfect. We're all broken. We're, we're, we're all in need of being repaired. And then you can take from the Romans chapter 3, verse 10. Now, as I bring these up, I'm going to ask folks to read. I'm going to ask folks to read that don't normally read. And you know who you are. You don't know. <laughs> kind of just sit back. So come on and just, just plug in, jump in. Romans chapter 3, verse 10. First premise of the Romans road. Think of this as having a conversation with, them, with one, right? First point is, listen, ain't nobody perfect. None of us, none of us are perfect. Are you waiting for somebody to read that that has never read before? Yep. Okay. okay. <laughs> As it is written, there is no one righteousness, not even one. That's pretty straightforward, isn't it? Is anyone perfect? I know you think, I know you think Christians think that they're holy rollers, but this is what God says. God says there's no one righteous, not one. All of us are broken. And that's all you have to share. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. That leads to a second question. Well, is there any exception? Hey, okay, I may not be, I may not be perfect, but hey, you know, I don't do this and I don't do that and I don't do this and I don't do that. Is there any exception? Take them to the next verse. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And here's where I think this is so essential for us to grasp. And it is the definition of how we measure sin. So here in Romans 3.23 to the question is, is there any exception? Hey, because I don't steal. I don't, I don't do what those folks do. I don't do what... But I ain't as bad as those folks, you know, and, 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 and is there an exception for me? Is there anybody that might qualify? Romans 3.23 says, no. Everybody is sin. And look at the definition and evaluation of what sin is. What's the evaluation of sin in this verse? Coming short of the glory of God. Coming short of the glory of God. We measure sin, human behavior to human behavior. The Bible really measures sin in a relationship to God's glory, God's nature, God's character, God's holiness. And with that as the measurement, 
everybody. There is no exception. All of us fall short. Does anybody know, and you could use this as an illustration for people. Anybody know what the, the, uh, uh, the Greek word for sin, it gives a picture of somebody um, shooting an arrow at a target. And the ideal is that the person is aiming to hit the bullseye of the target. But as he releases the arrow with every intent and every purpose, to hit the bullseye, the arrow just falls short of the target. That's the picture here in this verse. That as good as we might try, when God is the standard, all of us fall short. So it's not that you don't hang out, you don't do what other folks do, you don't do this sin, that sin, that sin. The issue is, there's no exceptions because God is the standard and none of us can measure up to God. Second thing, and again, think of these as having a conversation with someone. Man, is anybody perfect? No. Is there any exception? No. Everybody has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Well, where does sin come from? And this is where we move the conversation with them from beyond actions to talking about nature. Romans 5.12. Someone read, someone read this for us, please. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because of sin. See, and who... Who alive doesn't know the story of Adam and Eve, right? You don't have to be a Christian to know the story of Adam and Eve. Everyone can connect with that story. Where did sin come from? It came from when Adam and Eve messed up in the garden. That's where sin came from. Sin came through one man. The world blames Eve, but God blames Adam. Come on, Pastor Dave. <laughs> God is always about that headship. So this is an opportunity for, for, for us when we're sharing with people to say to them, it's not so much about what you're doing or not doing. But it's about the fact that we're all descendants of Adam. We all got this, this bloodline in us. That's where sin comes from. Now, at any point here, if, if somebody has a, a comment or a question, please kind of throw them out. Next set of questions. So again, think of this as a conversation. Where does sin come from? Came from Adam. Because of Adam, sin came into the world. Because sin came into the world, that's why we die. That's why the world is messed up. That's why there's earthquakes. That's why there's diseases. That's why there's death. That's why there's a coronavirus. Because Adam messed up all the plans that God had. The next question is, well, What do, we, what, what, what do we deserve for our sin? What's the consequence for all this? Because we all got it. We all got it from Adam. So what do we deserve for? Yeah. Yep. Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Right here, in this verse, we are, we are addressing two fundamental issues, right? For the wages of sin is death. What's a wage? It's a payment, payment for a service rendered. Mm -hmm. What's a gift?
something that's given freely, like without you didn't have to work for it. Or, you know. So look at this verse here. The question is, what do we deserve for our sins? We deserve death. That's why folks die. That's why you get cancer. That's why little babies are born with illnesses because of Adam. Adam released death into the world. But the gift of God, see, there's a contrast in this verse between a wage and a gift. And that's where you can turn it, you can start making the transition from the, 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 the condition and the state to now, here's where God starts positioning the way out for us. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. God, God has a gift. God has provided a way of hope. What is the way of hope? Well, somebody had to pay the price for our sin. Romans 5.8. Can I read that one? Yep. Uh, but God commandeth his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I love this verse. Who paid the price? How do I get out? Okay, if I'm in this condition because of Adam, and the, and, and the judgment against it is death. Man, how do I find my way out? How do I pay the price? Who pays the price? Is there a way out? What is the gift of eternal life? Take them right to Romans 5, 8. But God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What's the most powerful thing in this verse when you look at it? Christ died for us. Even yet while we were sinners. Yeah. God demonstrated his love for us. Yep. He didn't, Christ died for us, and he didn't wait for us to get right. He didn't wait for us to get right. That's a good one. God directed God commanded, that means he commanded, he directed his love towards us. Well, how do I know God loves me? Well, how do I know that's true? Because he had Christ died for us while we were still sinners. There was a price you and I couldn't pay, but he said, Jesus out of love to pay that price for us while we were yet sinners, when there was no way possible for us to make ourselves right with God. Shayla, let me ask you a question. Is there any condemnation or judgment in that message? No. No? Very straightforward. I mean, how could someone feel they're being judged, right? Yeah, yeah, God, God says we're all sinners, not because of what you did, but because of what Adam did. And while we were still in that state, God sent his only son. He commended his love toward us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So the hang up for God isn't so much our actions as much as it is our condition, our nature. And then the last, the last thing in a conversation is, well, what's the way out? Jesus paid the price for me. Okay. Jesus died on the cross. You guys are going to be celebrating, you know, the resurrection Easter Sunday. Hey, you know, and there's hardly, well, it might change now with our society, but growing up, everybody went to church on Easter, right? So what's the way out? Again. 
Think of these as having a conversation with folks. And you don't have to necessarily use these phrases, but I just structure them in a way that we can think of it as a flowing conversation. But what's the way out? If Jesus paid the price, okay, what's the way out? How do I benefit from that? Romans, Romans chapter 10, verse 11, 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13. And we'll dissect each, each one of these verses. Someone read uh, verse 9 for us, please. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Okay, now, now. about to get real excited here. I had to catch myself. All right. This is the terms of the, of the covenant, if you will. Here, God is making it very clear for us what the basis of being saved is, right? There's, there's, there's a couple of things that I have to do. Because the question is, what is my response, right? What, 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 what do I do about this? What's the way out? If Okay, if Jesus paid the price, right? God, God commended his love towards me. Jesus paid the price for me because I was a sinner. I couldn't pay it myself. You know, how do I get out? The first thing is, when we look at this verse, there's two requirements that God clearly states that are necessary to be saved. What are those two requirements? You declare with your mouth and believe in your heart. So, so, so there's something I got to say, right? That there's, there's something I have to speak. I've got to say something. I've got to confess something. I've got to declare something, right? I got to declare that Jesus is Lord. That he's everything that he says he is. And we'll, we'll, we'll get into that piece, but I, I want to really focus on this next part. And then there's something that I have to believe in my heart. And what do I have to believe in my heart? That God raised him from the dead. Now, we talked about this a little bit on, on Thursday. I mean, I'm sorry, on Wednesday. What does that word believe mean? It's not you an have, yes. you have to put trust in application. I'm sorry, say it again. You have to put in trust with my implication to entrust. To entrust. That's it. See, when the Bible says I have to believe in my heart, that means I have to trust. What do I have to trust? Who he is and what he did. We, we've turned belief into an intellectual acknowledgement. It's more than just intellectually acknowledging that Jesus was a guy that, 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 that lived and, and, and that he died. I have to trust. And what is it that I have to trust? That God raised him from the dead. God raised him from the dead. Mm -hmm. And you see how in most of our witnessing, we have been, we were trained to just say, hey, Jesus died for your sin, but never to tell people the second part that he rose for your justification. B biblical faith is the requirement of trusting in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Look at verse 10 and 11. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. No, no, no. This is just me. This is just me. Um, 
So th this 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 is the part of, of, of the Romans road where you are bringing a person to understand what their response to the gospel message is. And it's a simple message. There's a whole lot that could be in there, but doesn't need to be in there because the, the, the Romans road is, is, is enough biblical information not to appeal to the intellect, but to, to appeal to the hungry heart of a person seeking relationship with God, right? You want to share this with a person that wants to argue and debate? It's not going to be effective. You want to share this with somebody who's really hungry to figure out how to have a relationship with God? It's right here. And in this verse, in 10 and, 10, 10 and 11, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It's in turn. I have a question for you, not to cut you off, babe. I'm sorry. That's okay. If we are, if we do come across someone who you see that they're just kind of trying to play devil's advocate and trying to kind of just get a reaction out of you with the correct response, kind of just be, well, you know, whenever you're ready, we can have the conversation about it. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Because this is, this is, this is, this is for this, this, this is to, 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 for, for, for folks who you, you've been engaging, you've been talking with, and you get the sense, man, that, you know what, that they, they really want to understand how to have a relationship with God. Folks that aren't interested in trying to understand how to have a relationship with God, this isn't, this, this, this isn't. And the reason why is look at verse nine and look at verse 10. And in both of these cases, you have to believe in your heart. You have to trust in your heart in verse nine. Verse 10, right? For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. This is a heart thing, not a head thing. Too often, we try to appeal to people's head because we come from a Western society. And in a Western society and culture, we think like the Greeks, right? Logic and reason. It's not about logic and reason. Salvation isn't based upon bringing somebody to an intellectual comprehension. Salvation is based upon convincing a person in their heart. Because you ever like, you ever like, um, like in your mind, you wanted to do something, and in your mind, you convinced yourself of doing something, but you knew in your heart, like you felt like, man, I knew, we would say like in my gut, man, I knew I shouldn't have fooled with them. Something was telling me, that was your heart. See, that, that, that's why salvation is, it, it's not all these external things, because look at verse 10. Once you believe in your heart, the moment in your heart you believe this message about Jesus, that's the moment you're justified. That is the moment you are justified. And then when I speak that thing out of my mouth, when you confess it with your mouth, that you profess your faith and are saved, I accept Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior, I accept his penalty, his payment for my sin, and his resurrection for my justification. That's what people's way out is. Verse 12, it doesn't matter who you are. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile. It doesn't matter who you are. This thing works the same. For everybody. And here's where, you, here's where you lead with verse 13. For everyone. Someone read that last part for me. Verse 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now. What's the basis of me being saved? Everyone. Yeah. Everyone who calls. Listen, didn't say anything about walking down front. 
didn't say anything. All these, and I'm not trying to be anti, I'm really not. I'm just trying to disconnect us in our thinking from these paradigms that we were taught that are necessary for salvation. No, it's about somebody simply calling on the name of the Lord because they heard the message, they believed it in their heart, and they spoke it out their mouth. So, real quick, I gave it to you really, really quick. It's a simple, very, very simple biblical model to use with people. It's really about nine short verses. I'm going to send you guys something in an email and you can memorize it, not memorize it, but go over it and actually use it as a sheet. Have the sheet down sit, sitting with you in front of people. But it's an easy way to be able to share with people the gospel message. Now, thoughts, responses, just to what we presented so far. I like the sheet idea, especially when you're dealing with the children. Yep. Does this, does something like this take away some of the uh, concerns or hesitation to share? No, this is a really good way of getting it out to the unsaved. I, I think it's a it's a great way to um, open up a conversation, but the, this my friend she's Jehovah Witness and she's tough. I don't know what to say about them, but she's tough. She is so far into this religion that uh, she's tough. All I think that I could do, I'm, I don't pressure anybody, but if I pray to the Lord and ask Him to intervene, if He could speak through my mouth in a way that she'll understand that's i don't know what could possibly crack that nut if i could say it a different way i would but i don't know how to say it oh here's the reality here's the reality that nut, that that may never be cracked that that's nut, true that nut that nut may never be cracked yeah that's, that's what i was getting ready to say that nut might not be cracked mona but, but um, that's sad it is because it's somebody who you love. Um, but you know what, Pastor? The way you did this Romans Road to Salvation is excellent because it really does bring up um, some good ways of allowing those who don't know the Roman Road to get to know it and better understand it because you are asking the questions that they have with answering it with the word of God. And, and, and you can you can formulate your own framing questions, right? You don't have to use the ones I threw up there, right? You know I me, mean? I get over intellectual sometimes on stuff. You can just use your own words, right? And then, here, and then here's what happens. You'll start with this, and then guess what the Holy Spirit will do? The Holy Spirit will move you beyond what's in the framework. Amen. Because there may be an additional question, and you'll be you'll be amazed. You'll be amazed when you just say, God, I'm going to be obedient. And, and my obedience is to tell it. Okay. And now, God, I have a tool that makes it easy for me to tell it. I was intimidated because I didn't think I could tell it right. Here's a simple tool for me to tell it. You said that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. I'm just going to give people the word. It's not my job to convince them to be saved. It's my job to give them the clear message of the gospel. What happens between their heart and you, that's on the Holy Spirit and them. I've done my job. See, it's not our job to bring people to salvation. It's our job to share the message of salvation. 
and trust the work of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and this may trigger something in somebody's heart that God may send another believer that they know at work or another believer who plays hockey, you know, who, 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 who's the parent of somebody their kid plays soccer with to water on that message. But the point is that we've got to become committed to sharing our faith to sharing the message of the gospel. And the reason why it's so important is this is what the result of sharing the gospel is. This is what this is this is the position that God wants to bring people into. Romans 5, 1 and 2. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, that word justification, because we're going to talk about this on Easter um, um, Resurrection Sunday. Justified means as if I'd never sinned, as if I've never done wrong, that my record is clean. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. This is where you can leave someone. This is the result of making that confession, believing in your heart. It puts you in a position where you can have peace with God. Because apart from believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth that Christ is Lord and that God has raised Jesus from the dead. And then you can get in there talking about his death, his burial, his resurrection, right? There's no way to have peace with God. Men stay Men and women stay separated. They stay disconnected from God. And without the gospel message, they try to build their own bridges to God, but those bridges are insufficient to get them across. Good works can't get them across. Religion can't get them across. Morality can't get them to cross. So many people, they think, well, if I just go to church, well, if I just try to be good, that 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 that's enough, but it's not it's not enough. The only thing that can get people across from being separated and disconnected with God is the gospel. And if we don't tell it, if we don't share it, then here's here's like what are we doing? We plan church because we're not committed to his mission. All right, before we take communion, I told you this be quick. Open comments, thoughts input, anything you want to go back, review, ask a question about? Pastor, I just, I wanted to say for me, I, I think what, what I found very helpful about this, uh, this lesson is, I, I think when we think of, of sharing the gospel and, and so forth, I almost felt like I had a mindset of, of getting them to salvation mm. as opposed to just simply sharing God's goodness and letting the spirit and, and God do the rest. Very well said, Mike. Yeah. There was a quote. There was a quote. Um, yeah, Mike, I agree with you. Yeah, there was a quote by Tim Keller that says the gospel is the good news of what God has done for us, not what we have to do for God. So, so, so oftentimes people of, of, of good intent trying to reach the people who are lost, they tell people what they need to do for God. Oh, you need to stop doing this. You need to stop doing that. You need to stop doing this. You need to start going to church, right? Because that's how we've been trained. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. not the gospel. That's about what you can do for God. That's works. The gospel is about what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. Can I say something to Mona? Mona, um, 
your 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 friendship really touched me there with that with that other lady. Um, I would continue to still be her friend. Um, obviously, pray for her. Um, um, ask for discernment, and um, you know, continue to be you with who you are and who you believe in. Um, it's it's not a right or wrong here, but um, you know, uh, just continue to ask the Holy Spirit for guidance, and then you gotta move out of God's way. I agree with that. And I understand that she was here this morning and wanted to listen to her service. And I allowed her to listen to her service because I listened to my service. Of course, she left when I turned my little Zoom platform on. But uh, but there's so much. It was so strange. It was so strange. It reminded me a lot of uh, the Mormon service that I went to. They've got all the movements, all the songs, all the movements, but uh, they just don't believe in the Christ. It's, oh, I feel so bad for her because I, I love this girl. She's like my daughter. I don't have any children. And this kid, is she's right there. She's there for me always. Like, she's my family. She's, a good she's, she's there. Yeah, she's a good friend. She is. She's a very good friend. Right. Just if I can just jump in there for a minute, I just want to say, you know, Mona, I'm one of those nuts that was cracked. Like, I was brought up in the Jehovah's Witness faith. My entire family is in that faith, other than my mother and her five kids. So all my aunts, uncles, cousins, grandmother, everybody was a witness. And I made my way out. And so what I wanted to suggest to you is that you just keep opening your mouth to speak because don't whatever you do, don't become argumentative and, you know, start comparing scriptures because they can flip through that thing in a minute. <laughs> okay? Oh, yes, she can. I'm not that yeah. dumb. I know. I know. I don't. I don't dare argue. So don't 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 become argumentative in the in the moment. Just say whatever it is that you need to say and uh, rely on God to to speak to her heart. Adam, she, you may not think that she's listening, but when she walks away, she will process everything that you told her. So just I put hope the, so. Uh, I hope so. Can I I, I'm Can I grateful. In? Having been a Jehovah's Witness for twenty years, trying to talk to a Jehovah's Witness and trying to con convert them is not going to work. I know that. They have to come, <laughs> I they know have to that. Come. I just, wow. Yeah. It's, yeah. She's tough. Yeah. She's tough. Yeah. She's as and hard I, as I am. <laughs> well, no, it's not about being tough. It's the time that they put in. I mean, they're out there witnessing. You know, Dave's talking about people preaching the gospel. Oftentimes, you got people out there 10 hours a month. You're knocking on doors and talking to people. Oh, so, yeah, they do. They do. You know, so, and also, they're doing through training. That's absolutely amazing on a regular basis. They're trained to deal with objections as soon as you bring them up, once you think of them. So I would just build a relationship. Eventually she'll learn, like I learned and other people have learned too, you know, but concentrate who, who you can win. That may not be one of them. Just like they no, said. Well, I'm not winning anybody. Michael, yeah. I'm not winning anybody. I'm just, I'm just being who I am. And I pray for her because she's very dear to me. And yeah. I, I know that God will open up her eyes and her heart. I know that he will. And that he answers is, my prayers. And that's he will. And that's the prayer that you pray that that God will will remove the veil from from her eyes. Because to, to the point that 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 both of our former Jehovah Witnesses made, I I worked next to an elder at the Kingdom Hall when I was a very young Christian for three years, and I would bet, like, I would bet ten thousand dollars. And I'm not exaggerating. I would bet $10,000. You take the average Jehovah Witness and you take the average quote unquote Christian and you set them down at a table with a Bible and say, defend what you believe biblically. I would bet on the Jehovah Witness every time. You see, you she's speak. all over me, Pastor. She's all over me. She <laughs> knows what she's talking. She knows her religion. Because here's why. Here, here's what my pastor, this is what my pastor used to say, um, that that our friends and the, the Jehovah Witnesses, they have the right method, but the wrong message. See what, and, and Mike then could speak to this. They train and equip. They don't come to church to feel good and have an experience. They come to get trained and equipped and taught. We come to have an experience. We want some goose pumple, some goose pimples. We want to have a moment with God and then leave out just as ignorant as when we came in. 
That's right. Right. You know, I'm Is wondering. That- I'm wondering if if because they they have they are this religion and and it's not one that's from God and um, I wonder if if uh, the, if if Satan has a way to uh, you know like stroke them stroke their whatever they need to be stroked you know like we go for I go and I wait for God to show up I wait to feel him I don't always feel him but I know he's there but I I wait for that and I wait for that every day. Um, and I wonder if they do, and if they get that. Because no, they're programmed. No, they're programmed. That's they're what it programmed. is. They're programmed. When you come up as Jehovah's Witness, you are trained to understand that there's the world, and there's you know outside. Then with there, then there's safety of the congregation. And you're trained to basically be that way. The fact that she's built a strong relationship with you is pretty unique because normally they stay amongst themselves. That's it. Yeah, I figured because she, she had me listening to her service today, and I listened, but I dare yeah. not say anything against it. I would never do that. That's and, and the thing is, is that Dave comes the closest to training people because he actually goes over scripture and training. Most other yeah. churches don't do what Dave does. No, they don't. Not at all. You you may have a limit of what one to two scriptures before you're taught that you know get people focused on other emotional things but Jehovah's witnesses they train hard and they equip just like Dave equips us you you're not going to find another priest that does the same thing that Dave does in terms of education oh I know (laughs) yeah I know I know that because I know for me as a kid I was in study every single day like we Tuesday Wednesday and uh Sunday we were in the, the kingdom hall and if we weren't there we were out walking around knocking on doors and it was like like he was saying it was really pushed down our throats like we were trained every single day to believe what we believed but the only thing that really worked for me is I had to deprogram myself of everything that I felt that I was taught over the years I had to remove it all and start all over again from square one and I had to find out who Christ was for myself and not what I had been taught about him from all these years so I knew a lot about who Jehovah God was but I knew absolutely nothing about Christ but I knew everything there was to know about Satan the devil because it seemed like they talked more about him than anybody else and so when it came to the world like he was saying there's the world and then there's them and anybody that's of the world to them it seemed to be looked upon as as evil and so they're trained not to listen to what most people have to say because to to them that's evil anything kind of what they're taught is evil yeah i get that yeah i um good morning everybody my name is eduardo Martinez. Um, I wasn't going to come in today because I'm not really feeling well. Um, but I know my ears don't really feel sick, so I knew I could listen. I was just kind of feeding myself the idea that because I'm sick, I shouldn't be here. But anyway, I, um, I joined up. And your conversation is very interesting to me because I've been approached by Jehovah's Witness uh, several times throughout the years. Uh, years ago, Mormons came to my door, Jehovah's Witness came to my door, and part of me, I feel like, was always seeking guidance. Some underlying way, I thought about it, fought the idea of it, because I was caught up with living such a sinful life, and the addiction of that was hard to let go. So, but a part of me really wanted to, was very interested, so I let Jehovah's Witness in my home, I spoke with them, they spoke with me. I asked questions, um, and I felt like no matter what I brought up, no matter what questions I asked, I always felt like I was undermined and judged in a way where I was doing something wrong. Now, I'm not a religious person um, then, and then I'm trying to have a relationship with God now. And um, just recently, uh, this lady reached out to me on the phone. I don't know how she got my number, but she... She's Jehovah's Witness. She reached out to me about a couple months ago. And uh, this was before I joined uh, with uh, you guys on the virtual, you know, the virtual uh, church stuff or whatever. And um, she was trying to convince me, you know, to do the Jehovah's Witness thing. And 
I, I respectfully told her that I, I will have a conversation with her. We can definitely talk and we can definitely entertain each other as far as feeding ideas or whatever. And, um, you know, I'm not against that. Um, but I told her I did um, make a commitment, um, you know, and, and I'm going this route with it. And she did respect the, you know, my decision. Um, with that being said, I also told her, I would listen to her and I would talk with her because I didn't want to judge her in a way where like her opinion didn't count. Um, but I did it. I did get the feeling she was very, she was very aggressive about it, which I really appreciate. But at the same time, I just didn't fall in line with some of the beliefs. Um, but I, res I respect the effort. And <clears throat> this morning, uh, you know, I hear about listen, listening to your heart and uh, not your mind, you know, because your heart speaks with you. And the lesson today, uh, at one point, uh, Pastor was saying that, you know, that's not your mind, it's your heart when you're telling yourself something not to do it, to do it. And that's what I was struggling with this morning, not going, not coming into church. And but my heart was telling me, you know, you could go, you know, you could try. And so I tried and I came in and I feel very blessed listening to you guys because I feel like a lot of your experiences, um, you know, I've gone through a little bit anyway. And um, I just want to say thank you for the lesson and I thank you for your stories and the things that you guys say. Like I said, I'm, I'm like clenching my fists right now and I'm like very nervous. Um, but like I said, I'm trying to come out of my shell because I want to face my fears trembling. Mm. Um, even if it means I sound awkward or weird about it, I just wanted to say thank you to you guys. And um, I, it really touched my heart to hear how welcoming you are to someone who's not in line with your beliefs. Um, and also I want to thank the, the pastor for the lesson this morning because it really, I feel like I came in right on time to hear what I needed to hear. And that has to be God speaking through my heart. Hmm. And that's all I wanted to say. You did a good job. You really helped me out, Eduardo, you did. Just the fact that you're there and you came and you were obedient and your ears weren't sick. I loved that. <laughs> that was really yeah. wonderful. So I want to say thank you. Thank you very much. That was thank you to all of you. Thank you, guys. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'll th thank you for sharing, Edward. And and you didn't sound weird. You didn't sound un uncomfortable. It was it was perfectly said. Thank you for your transparency. And we 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 receive you as part of the community. And. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful and I want to encourage you that Resurrection Sunday, you can join us um, at, uh, at our service, um, which is, uh, Eduardo, give me your phone number so I, can, so I can follow up with you. Definitely, yeah. Yep, I'll do that. Hold on. What, do I just type it in the thing or something? I don't know. I've never done that. Okay, just can, are you comfortable with just giving it to me out loud? Oh, yeah, yes, yes. 484-597-0026. Uh, four, four, zero, zero, zero. <clears throat> zero, zero, zero. Yep. Gotcha. I'll follow up with you. Okay. Thank so, you. So, so here, here's the thing, guys, and then we'll, then we'll take communion. It's good, good, good conversation, good, good discussion, you know. I'm really, man, um, I want to make sure I say this right, because I don't want to sound like I'm, I'm, the, I'm the salvation police or I'm the anti-church guy. I'm not anti-church. My whole motivation in this is just simply to help us to understand where we need to change our thinking and to become more aligned biblically than we are institutionally. And that the whole ideal of thinking about evangelism and the gospel, right, and the message of the gospel, how do you share the gospel, 
it's it's a different mindset than just inviting people into church. Inviting people to come to church isn't wrong. It's not bad, but that's not evangelism. Evangelism is when you and I are able to share the message of the gospel with people who are in the circles of influence of our lives. And then they're, they're coming into the institution of the church is more about them being discipled. And oftentimes we invite people to church because we don't know how to share the gospel like it's been like 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 many of you have have identified. So what the Romans road provides for us is a real simple tool that will help us to be able to explain at a fundamental level. It's not all inclusive of the truths. It's very fundamental. Right. And it's easy and it's a starting ground for us with people. And if we start, the Holy Spirit will add. You'll be surprised how the Holy Spirit will add as that conversation with that individual evolves and they'll go away and the Lord will start ministering to them and sending other people. Our goal, we can't make, we, it, it, the, the goal is to share the gospel message. That's the commandment right? To share the gospel message. God produces salvation. We just have to be consistent with sharing the message.